today we're going to be going down the rabbit hole quite a bit. Uh, and that is, we're going to enter into a discussion, or just a monologue, uh, concerning Artemis of Perge. Now, most of you have never heard of Artemis of Perge. Uh, and if you, you know, or, you know, I, I brought it up and you heard, you know, heard me mention it, and you probably thought to yourself, okay, so you're going to Google. And when you Google, uh, you'll realize that there's not that many entries that come up. And uh, one that does come up is the last time I did a talk on Artemis of Perge. So, so it's, it's not a very popular topic. And the reason is, is that it's kind of cutting edge. It's materials that most people do not know about. And uh, it is, in a sense, uh, a way to, uh, how do I put this, get into a conversation that we ordinarily wouldn't be in uh, otherwise. Uh, so uh, that means that uh, you're going to have to write down and keep track of a lot of names of, of people and places just a little bit uh, to be able to uh, put your, uh, be able to comprehend this topic. I'm going to give a quick overview here, and then we'll we'll go there. Uh, first of all, um, uh, the goddess Artemis uh, obviously is. Uh, connected very much to an Anatolian context. And the city of Perge is located in the southern part of Anatolia or Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. Uh, she was known as the queen of Perge uh, in a place known as Pamphylia. Her cult, however, her worship goes pretty far back all the way back to the time of the ancient Luvians. <laughs> and you're looking at me like, Luvians? Who are they? <laughs> well, the I'll kind of break this down just a little bit. Uh, you have those known as the Hittites, who are Indo-Europeans. They kind of moved down south into Anatolia uh, around 3000 BCE, uh, bringing this, a special culture with them. And the Hittites, with them, there's another group that's related to them in language and culture, and they're known as the Luvians. It's spelled L-U-W-I-A-N-S. And what happens is while the Hittites dominate the Anatolian plateau, the Luvians dominate the western and southern coast of Anatolia. Uh, this culture uh, is pretty exciting. Most people have never heard about it before. Archaeologists are now excavating the cities that are connected to the Luvians by looking at the satellite uh, images from above. We have determined that there is about 300 Luvian sites that still need to be excavated. And they're quite large indeed. And they can they contain, yes, many of them contain uh, inscriptions and manuscripts. Whoa. Yeah. So it is, a, it is a huge moment when it comes to ancient history. Now you kind of know where I'm going with this. <laughs> so you're kind of getting uh, the beginning of this Rosetta Stone, so to speak, of information. Uh, these Luvians. Um, one thing I'm going to say that will really catch your interest, the Luvians are the Trojans. Those of ancient Troy are Lubians. We know that beyond a reasonable doubt. So when we hear about the conflict between the Greeks and the Trojans. It's a conflict between the Mycenaeans and the Lubians. <laughs> Another interesting bit that most people do not know is that the Southern Lubians get pretty upset and uh, many of them become what we know as the sea people. <laughs> yeah, the sea people, you know, the ones that were part of ending uh, the, the Bronze Age, the Great Bronze Age collapse. We know that by name. <laughs> Who tells us? Well, of course, the Egyptians tell us, but other records too. I think I got your interest a little bit, right? <laughs> so, so the Luvians uh, are connected uh, to this particular goddess that we're gonna be talking about today, and that's Artemis of Perge. So not just the Luvians now, 
another group that's associated with them, of course, will um, uh, be, uh, of course, uh, an offshoot of, of, of connected to the Lubians, and those are the Lycians or the Lycians. So they are also they they're from the southern part of Anatolia. They are Luvians. Uh, if you know your Egyptian records uh, pretty well, they are also known as the Luka, L-U-K-K-A, uh, and you find that uh, the Luka were used as mercenaries uh, in the various battles between the Egyptians uh, and the Hittites. Cool stuff, right? Another group that's connected to uh, Artemis of Perge, hold your breath, the Minoans, <laughs> the Minoan civilization. And now we know, and actually have the DNA materials here, I'll read a little bit of it if you want. Uh, there's a connection between the Minoans and the, and the southern section of Anatolia. There is a bloodline. And so uh, where Perge is, so the Minoans were there. So you got that mixture. And beyond all that, of course, you infuse a little bit of the Mycenaeans. And then later on, put an overlay of the Greeks on top of it. And ta-da, you got uh, the background of Artemis of Perge. And it turns out uh, that uh, Artemis is connected to many indigenous beliefs in Anatolia. Uh, and we're gonna even go over the name uh, today. So uh, it should be interesting. So we're traveling back to the Bronze Age and then we're gonna move in uh, to the Iron Age. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and, and get started. Okay, so during the late Bronze Age, while the Hittites, as I said, occupied most of the central part of Anatolia, the Luvians, now that you know who they are, uh, related to them, uh, dominated much of the western and southern sections of Anatolia, which is Turkey today, inclusive of the region of Pamphylia. It's called Pamphylia. Uh, this is where Perge, P-E-R-G-E, -E, is located. Now, what is the word? Pamphylia mean. Um, obviously, the name Pamphylia is not from this era. It comes from later on. I have actually been uh, to Pamphylia quite a few times. Uh, I've explored the region and I've done research there. <laughs> and you're getting some of it today, too. <laughs> and I guess I plan to publish uh, some of these materials, but I don't mind uh, giving out the information that I'm giving today. But the word Pamphylia itself. Uh, is it, it's in, it comes from Greek meaning many tribes, many tribes. It also could be argued that it means all tribes uh, or maybe all languages. So what do we get from this? It means that um, uh, that when the Greeks came to this this coastline, uh, the region was occupied by a diversity of people who spoke different languages. So let's go into the geography of Pamphylia. Amphilia. By the way, if you ever have a chance, when you go to Turkey, I highly recommend going to Pamphylia. It is one of those beautiful sections of Turkey. I mean, here you have you have this beautiful coastline, and the water is almost turquoise in color, and you have a vast amount of vegetation and forests that go all the way uh, to this you know, the shoreline, and it's surrounded by mountains, and these mountains are also covered with forest. Uh, unbeknownst to many, Turkey is actually going to be very green and very lush. It's kind of like California. In fact, it's exactly like California. So, uh, so hey, maybe you've been there already, right? Uh, so, if we take a look uh, at Pamphylia. It's bordered on three sides by mountains. You got the uh, Lycian or Lycian Mountains to the west, the Taurus Mountains, the famous Taurus Mountains to the mm -hmm. north, and the hills of Rock Cilicia to the east. And to the south, you have the Mediterranean, uh, which basically dips into the plain and is known as the Bay of Anatolia. While the coastline moves generally straight uh, east to west, 
Soon after reaching Anatolia, uh, the shore turned sharply north to the south, uh, north to south. This is, of course, generally regarded as the end of Pamphylia, the beginning of Lycia. Uh, with that said, there's a city called the Salis, further down that north-south sharp coastline that sometimes is understood as Pamphylia and sometimes is understood as Lycia. As, as for the eastern border, uh, that would be Alanya uh, in the east. Now, there are many rivers. I know you're going, do we have to know the rivers? You got to know uh, one of them at least. Okay, so here we go. There's many rivers that flow from the mountains down into the Pamphylian plains. Okay. And so here are a few, okay, including, this is the important one, including what's called the Kestris, the Kestris River in ancient times known as the Aksutai. Uh, this goes directly by Perge, and that's why we have to remember it. So it is directly by Perge. You also have the Eurymidian going down by Espendos, uh, and the Melus going down to the city of Side. It is notable that many of the major cities of Pamphylia are located inland from the sea, especially Perge, Cilion and Espendos. Uh, now, the mountains surrounding Pamphylia somewhat isolates the region. But there are ways to go, is various passes. And for our topic, the Kestris River is an important passageway. And again, it flows right next to Perge. Now, here we go. So let's, let's get in a little bit. As for the population, of Pamphylia. The region primarily was occupied by those mysterious Luvians at first, with, with one group of the Luvians, one group of the Luvians, known as the Luca, L-U-K-K-A, uh, that dominated the region up to the Kestris River. So it was so everywhere that was um, west of the river was occupied then by these Luvians known as the Luca. Later, or you could see L U K K A will be understood as L Y C I A, and those are the Lycians. Got it? See, those, there's a connection between those words. But uh, to the east of the Kestris River, uh, you have a mix of other Luvian groups, and to some degree, the Hittites too. So in a sense, Perge is on the borderland, got it, guarding the river between the Luca on one side uh, and the other uh, 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 groups like the Hittites, obviously, and a, and a mix of, of, of other um, um, um Alluvians on the other side. Now, what happens is, is that you're thinking, okay, I got this down, Dr. Rika. You got it there. Well, beyond the Luvians and Hittites, we have in the archaeology, we have around 1500 BCE. We have evidence also that the Minoans also came here. So, uh, and uh, in, inter interacted. And then, of course, later on, the Mycenaeans also visited. So, the Minoan association with Anatolia has been confirmed. Uh, and I'm going to give you some goobly goop information if you're interested. Uh, we know that the Y chromosome results from the Cretan population, and it reveals a direct correlation with the people of Anatolia, and in general, the dating of the Halpo group known as J2A1HM319. <laughs> in Crete uh, uh, is connected with the indigenous peoples going back to 3100 BCE. How's that for science? <laughs> so, yes, they're related. That's right. The Minoans are related. You're thinking, but the Minoans are Greek. Don't tell a Minoan that because they're not Greek. <laughs> the Mycenaeans are Greek. The Minoans are not. That making sense. The later Minoans intermarried with the Greeks. That's why there's a confusion there. Uh, but I hope that helps. Uh, we have, of course, uh, taking a look here. Uh, we, we realize 
that uh, uh, the earliest Neolithic sites of Europe are located in Crete and mainland Greece. A debate does persist concerning whether these farmers originated in the neighborhood of Anatolia, uh, but uh, we won't go into that. I actually have more DNA evidence, uh, actually a whole page worth, but uh, I think we're done with that. Let's. So we do have evidence for this connection. Now let's go into, we're move, we move from the science, let's move into the mythology, or I should say maybe the history, although when we're talking about Herodotus, <laughs> I'm not sure what to think at times. Herodotus, uh, as well as other uh, Greek writers, established that King Minos uh, had great influence over Western Anatolia. Uh, of course, the word Minos, that connects to the word Minoan uh, later on. For example, Herodotus establishes that the Lilligates were once subject to Minos of Crete and lived on the Aegean Islands until driven out by the Dorians and the Ionian Greeks, uh, of course. So you have this, again, this legendary association going on there. Furthermore, we have uh, the Lycians were also thought to have originated from Crete according to the, the, the mythology there. Of course, Lycians are connected with Luca, so you can see how there's this relationship that kind of goes back and forth between uh, Crete, as well as Cyprus, and the mainland. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I'm going to read you Herodotus. Herodotus states that the Lycians were from Crete in ancient times, he says, uh, for in the past, none that lived on Crete were Greek. Now there was a dispute in Crete about the royal power between a certain Serpentin and Minos, son of Europa. Minos prevailed in this dispute and drove out Serpentin, and Serpentin will be important uh, to Pamphylian culture, so that's why we're talking about them. So Serpentin uh, moved out along with his partisans, who after being driven out, came to the Malayan land of Asia, what is now possessed by the Lycians was in the past Malayan, and the Malayans were also called the Solomite. For a while, Serpentin ruled them, and the people were called the Termile, Termile, which was the name that they had brought with them, and that is still given uh, to the Lycians by their neighbors. Okay, so we have this, this interesting connection, right? Uh, for a while, uh, Serpentin ruled them, all right, as I mentioned before, uh, but then uh, after, uh, of course, um, by the way, we do have inscriptional evidence that connects what is being said by Herodotus uh, right down to the material culture in Lycia, so there is a connection. Uh, their customs, accordingly, uh, he says, were are partly Cretan and partly Carian. And you go, Carian, what's a Carian? Okay, so not to be too complicated, if you got the Pamphylians, Pamphylians, and then you got next to them the Lycians, and next to them you have the Carians. So, uh, but um, I'm bringing this up. Here we go. But he says they have one thing which is their own. Here it is. Uh, which is, uh, here it is. But they have one thing which is their own and shared by no other men. They take their names not from their fathers, but from their mothers. And when one is asked by his neighbor who he is, he will say that he is the son of such a mother and rehearse the, mo the mother of the, his mother and so forth. Indeed, if a female citizen marries a slave, her children are considered pure-blooded. But if a male citizen, even the most prominent of them, takes an alien wife or concubine, the children are dishonored. Well, what are you saying here? Well, you can see here, and you can see it pretty easily, that uh, you have the remnants of an egalitarian society. Are you seeing that, right? And you'll see more of that as we go along. Don't worry, I'm gonna give you more evidence. We're just, we're building the case. <laughs> and you're gonna see, as time goes on, that women in Pamphylia and Lycia had more rights and privileges and were viewed with esteem than other places uh, throughout the ancient world. In fact, uh, I don't want to give too much away ahead of time, but uh, 
you're, you're going to see that uh, within the cult of Artemis of Perge, uh, women were not only equal, they were in many ways above that of men. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is going to be a fun ride. So, all right, building the case, you keep on going here. So, um, what will happen here is archaeologists, of course, uh, have discovered that, uh, you know, the Minoans did settle all along the coast of, of Asia Minor. And that gets kind of confusing because you're going, wait a minute. Um, I, I thought, uh, I thought you said the light, you know, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the other groups uh, were, were occupying there, the Luvians, for example. Well, what's going to happen is while the Luvians will dominate the east, sorry, the, the western coast of Asia Minor and the southern coast of Asia Minor, what will happen is the Minoans will establish trading posts along that same coast, along the west as well as the south uh, coast, and they'll interact with one another. And then later on, when the Minoans fall, then the Mycenaeans, who are Greeks, will take over those areas where those Minoan colonies are, and then they will have this relationship uh, with the uh, with Alluvians. Got it? So that's kind of how it works. Now, let's get uh, to the. Um, by the way, it's uh, it's called the Asua League, but we'll talk about that later. So during the 13th century BCE, we find the first mention of the city of Perge. Uh, that's located in Pamphylia, 13th century BCE, that's 1200s. We find this <laughs> in a treaty between the Hittite king, uh, Tudahalia, uh, the fourth, and Karunta, who is the king of Karhuntasa, uh, and who was his vassal. According to the treaty, the western border of Karunta's territory was the city, city of Parha and the Castreas River, or as we, of course, know as the Castreas River. And so here it now, according to the treaty, west of Perge were designated the lands, this, they're actually called the Luca lands. There you have it. So at this time of the treaty, Perge, uh, however, was about to fall into the hands of the Hittites. Now, the exact location of the, uh, the city of Parhutasa is unknown with suggestions from ranging from Konya, Kaisarai, and Cappadocia. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, because Perge was directly west of the Kestros, the city was not included as part of the kingdom of Targutasa, but considered part of the Luca lands. And we see here, of course. Uh, now, uh, we will go into the minutia. We know a lot about Karuta, by the way. But as for Karuta, we would just say, uh, King Moatali sent Karuta to be raised by his younger brother, Hattuselus III, during which time his son, Tulahia, became very close. And King Muatali decided to move his capital, Tarantusa. In exchange, he made his younger brother, Hattuselus III, the governor of Hattusa. It gets, we're, we're dealing with Hittite politics. <laughs> and I'm not, I don't expect you to go through all of these names. Okay, so, but there you have it. Well, it turns out, I do have to bring this up, uh, is that we realized that um, there is a conflict in the Hittite records with another group. Uh, and that was not just the Luka, but it's another group known as the Ahiyawa. The Ahiyawa, A-H-H-I-Y-A-W-A. That's, of course, uh, also known as the Achaeans, and so these are the Mycenaeans. And so what happens is, according to Hittite records, the Luca are making an alliance with the Greek Mycenaeans against the, uh, the Hittites. And so, and of course, right in the middle of this uh, is, is Perge, right? Uh, and uh, and I won't talk too much about this, but I'll just go here a little bit. And here we go. This is a quick summation because, again, this is material that most people don't know. You go, you're talking about the sea people, uh, confused. Where does this come in? So what happens is during the late 1200s, I'm sorry, early, I'm sorry, late, late 1200s, 
what happens is this, is that um, the Luvians, including the Luca, have a trade, a metal ore trade with Cyprus. And so they become very rich with this trade from Cyprus. There are stories about this, right? You know? uh, and uh, the Hittites, they become a little bit greedy. Uh, what I mean by greedy is that they don't want uh, their, uh, the, their, their fellow Luvians, who are considered kind of less than themselves, uh, to have a monopoly on this trade. So what they do is they cut through the territory of the Luvians in the south into the area of Pamphylia and cross over to Cyprus and they secure that trade. They secure that trade. Well, uh, what happens, the Luvians, including the Luca, uh, they don't like this too much. They're not very happy about this. They don't like the Hittites for doing this. Now, at the same time, the Luvians were used as mercenaries by the Hittites against the Egyptians, and the Egyptians were using the Luvians as mercenaries against the Hittites. And they're fighting back and forth. So basically, you have the Egyptians on their chariots. Uh, while, while the mercenaries do all the battle, they're fighting amongst themselves between Hittite forces and Egyptian forces. And it looked like if the Egyptians were losing that particular battle, all they would do is turn their chariots away and go off. Meanwhile, the mercenaries, these Luvians, would be cut down. <laughs> Not very nice stuff, right? You know, they're kind of fodder. And this goes back even to the vice versa. Well, you have something called the Peace of Kadesh, during which time uh, there's now peace between Egypt and, and the Hittites. And that means all of these mercenaries are now unemployed. So, who are Luvians? Many of them are Luvians. So they're going to turn, they want, they're going to want to turn against their previous employer. Are you seeing this? And then on top of it, right, the Hittites go ahead and they take Cyprus. So you can imagine, right, the Luvians are angry. And the Luvians make an alliance with the Mycenaeans. This is the time of the Trojan War. <laughs> are you guys following me, right? And so what's going to happen uh, is you see people go, these Luvians, along with other groups who felt disenfranchised, are going to go crazy uh, and go to battle. And as a result, the Hittites are going to fall. And much of the kingdoms uh, of the Middle East will also fall. Uh, and the Egyptians will be so weakened, it will be pretty much the beginning of the end of the new kingdom for the Egyptians. I mean, this is the fall of the Bronze Age. So how are the Luvians doing? They survive. They hang on. And they create a very unique culture that continues, right? And it brings in threads of other cultures as well. Okay. So what happens now uh, is that uh, we have another story. And that is, is that we have uh, the, the Mycenaeans, who are Greeks. Um, by the way, I just want to mention, well, I, I mentioned during the Trojan War, you, you do know that Artemis and Apollo are on the side of the Luvians, right? You didn't know that. Oh, uh, by the way, we do know the history of the Trojans, um, uh, who are Luvians. We know that history. I'll say this just for fun. You have the Luca. That's one particular group of Luvians. Another group, they're known as the Walusats. The Walusats. Walusa. Now, what happens is you have this W sound, wa, uh, in this particular, in the Luvian dialect that, of course, translates over into the Greek, walusa, with a wa. What happens is the W drops out, wa, and it becomes ilusa, ilusa, as in, you know, and so this region is connected to, you know, it's, sorry, the city is called ilusa in the area of Troas. And of course, in Lusa will eventually become the idea of the Iliad. Iliad comes from, so Walusa, Elusa, Iliad. And the region, the Truss region, becomes 
Troy. So it's kind of funny is that the region uh, is, is, is Troy in a sense, and the main city is Elusa. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, with California, it would be like confusing uh, the capital, calling the capital California and calling the state Sacramento. <laughs> so they got things kind of confused as time goes on. Just a little bit of heads up there. But uh, we do know the whole history here. Now, what will happen is you're going to have the fall and the Mycenaeans start to spread. Uh, spread uh, throughout this region, and including, of course, uh, a certain Mopsus is brought in, who's the grandson of Tiresias, and uh, he is also uh, arrives in Pamphylia, and is considered, in a sense, a second founder, but this is the Greek founder. So now we have the next overlap. So during the 12 into the 1100s, we have now the Greeks mixing with the Pamphylians. You guys got it? It's kind of like a, a nice big stew. Right now, moving right along. What about Artemis? Now you brought up Artemis. Is, is there so? What happens is is that you do have these uh, various indigenous places uh, that um, you know, and of course they have place names that are similar. But we do find that there is the word Artemis, and the Artemis. Uh, what happens is that word amalgamates with the mother goddess of Anatolia, especially in areas of Pamphylia and Lycia. So we do find the name Artemis in Linear B tablets. These are the Mycenaeans. These are the Greek Mycenaeans. It is mentioned there, but its context comes earlier and not from a Greek context. In fact, the context goes back to a Minoan and Luvian context, okay? We'll, we'll go into that a little bit. We'll, st we'll stick with the Mycenaeans. And for the Mycenaeans, so we look at linear B tablets, and we find Atimito, Atimito, and Atimete, right? And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Homer uh, in the Iliad refers this name uh, as connected to uh, the mistress of animals. Now, if you guys are familiar uh, with the Minoan civilization, the mistress of animals is connected to uh, those of, of Crete, the Minoan civilization. And of course, uh, in fact, she's also known as the master mistress of animals. And we find this also in Anatolian and Minoan art. But we take a look at the etymology of the name Artemis. And, uh, it, you know, some people say, well, it's Greek. It derives from the word arctos, meaning bear, uh, and it's connected to the bear cult in Attica. But this is a, a rather forced meaning, and it doesn't seem to connect with the ancient sources. Also, this bear cult was too localized a phenomenon and reveals more of a, like a recent attempt to claim this goddess as Greek. The name Artemis, in connection with the name Bitomartis, the goddess of mountains and hunting, who is primarily worshipped on Crete, and it was often viewed as uh, a mountain nymph, may have had some relations, as she is also synchronized with Artemis, according to ancient sources. So there is uh, an acknowledgement of a connection with the Cretan context, the Minoan context, but not the Attic context. But it looks like that uh, it appears that even the Minoan word is an offshoot of an earlier word. Here we go. This is, by the way, this is good stuff, and this is new stuff. So here we go. Now, the Lydians, who are connected, who are also, so Lydians are also connected, they're also Luvians. It's another group, Luvians, uh, Lydians, um, of Western Anatolia, called Artemis by the name of Artmus. And uh, there also seems uh, to be another connection. According to Lycian inscriptions, we see Artemis is referred to as Ertime. And of course, the question is, I'll ask, which is the older root? Or they derive from an older source? Well, here we go. So we take a look, and it looks that the word Ertimele which we see in the Lycian language, uh, is the one of the earliest forms of the word 
Artemis that we have Stephen Colvin and other scholars looking at this, but it appears that the root of the word Artemis is Southern Anatolia. Uh, it comes uh, from uh, those who are known as uh, Lupa Lycians. Uh, and, um, and so you see, and of course they are Luvians. Got the context. So we, we take a look. We do have the earliest name. So once again, Artemis becomes Ertemi, E-R-T-E-M-I, which in turn uh, uh, becomes uh, Ertemili. And you can hear the ancient feel to it. You even have the double P's that appear, uh, which goes all the way back. Mel Cart and others talk about this. So in essence, while we do not know the exact meaning of the name Artemis, we do know it's not Greek in origin. And this goes along with the goddess herself. Now, here we go. You go, oh, wait. So, as noted by Granager as well as others, the name Perge, or back to the city of Perge, where, where the Artemis of our study is centered, of course, uh, is also, he says, not in itself Greek, and it would have seemed to be Perea in the local dialect of the time the coins were, um, were minted, unquote. And again, uh, the word parha, which becomes perge, uh, is also an ancient Lycian or Lucan name. In fact, what we know from the evidence concerning ancient, ancient Papilia and perge in, in particular is that it is primary, primarily Luvian, but was contested by both the Hittites to the north and the Mycenaeans to the west, and that those Luvians who frequently centered this region happen to be known as the Luca, who would later be associated with the Lycians. Okay, there you have it. Okay, so, well, now, who were the Lycians? So they were kind of working their way down? Okay, so who were the Lycians? Okay, we know that they called themselves, according not only to written sources, but inscriptions, they called themselves the Termini. Uh, and, and a place, um, in fact, we see this at a place called Xanthos, there stands a trilingual stele uh, with the designation that says Termali, uh, and uh, also it is connected to the word uh, Luca. Okay, we know that the Lycian language was a form of Luvian. Uh, we know that the Lycians or the Luca were part of what's called the Asua League, uh, which are other uh, Luvians. Uh, we know that uh, uh, they were connected to the Walusians, as we talked about before. Uh, we know uh, that, uh, that while the Hittites fell, uh, the Luvians continued to be strong and steady. We do know also that uh, there is a reference uh, to uh, those associated with the Luvians, uh, even in the Iliad, uh, talking about that there too, uh, Sarpedon uh, and Glocos uh, and the Lycians are also mentioned as fighting on the side of the Trojans. So even uh, according to uh, the Iliad, uh, you have again Lycians were fighting uh, side by side with what we now know as the Trojans uh, in the end. Okay. Now what happens here is that um, now. What about the territory of the Lycians? We kind of talked about it, but the main central area is the Xanthos Valley. This is a place full of orchards and fields. Um, and uh, we know that uh, during the 14th century BCE, the King Mudawata uh, was chased by the King Atarissa of the Mycenaeans in this area. And uh, it was, um, and so we do know that there's some history, but there's a reference to a sanctuary. There's a what's the sanctuary uh, known as the Ma Shulalwa, uh, M A S H U I L U W A. And this particular place, Ma Shulalwa, I am saying it right. <laughs> it sounds like a bunch of mush, doesn't it? Ma Shulalwa, say that three times fast. <laughs> uh, it is identified with the holy site of Xanthos, spelled X-A-N, 
T-H-U-S. Uh, no wonder people don't want to go into this field. You have such fun words, right, to talk about, right? Uh, and, of course, the Sianta River goes through Xanthos, right? Uh, and it's considered, so it's considered all the way back when, considered all the way back in the late 14th century as a holy place. And it becomes Xanthos, and it will continue to be considered holy all the way into the Greek and into the Roman period of time. So this is a holy site, a very important place. Uh, now what happens is, what, what, what were the, um, uh, so Mashuala the sanctuary uh, will be connected with Xanthos, but specifically a nearby, a very nearby shrine known as the Latun. Got it? So while Xanthos is located nearby, Next to it is called Latun. The Latun uh, really is the site of the sanctuary of Mashu Lawa. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> you're going, so is this important? Yeah, Latun will be sacred to the goddess Leto. It will be sacred to her offspring, Artemis and Apollo. Got it? So we have established that going all the way back to the 14th century BCE, that you have a holy site uh, that will be connected directly uh, in a later form to Leto, Artemis, and Apollo. Okay, that's important. Okay, so what were the religious beliefs of the Luca? Right, as far as we know uh, from the Iliad, uh, we do know that the Luca. Worship a god by the name of Apollo. Hey, look, there's a connection already, right? Apollonius, right? Uh, so, in fact, uh, and uh, in fact, what happened when Glatos is is is, uh, is is killed, Apollo is the one to take his body back to Lycia to receive a proper burial. <laughs> so, Apollo, you're going. Wait a minute, after each other, and then we're just talking about Artemis. You mean Apollo has roots also? Uh, in Lycia, wow, this is like a double day, right? Okay, so yes, yes. So we we find this out. By the way, uh, one thing on the uh, well, we'll say one thing that's important about uh, the uh, uh, Troy also is that we have uh, Luvian literature that talks about the fact that Troy was actually viewed as the homeland of the Luvians, and that the Luvians spread from there along the western coast and down into the southern coast. So. Uh, there's, there's there's more connections, but uh, one of the things about the, the Luca. Um, so Luca, of course, are the Lycians, and they're connected to uh, the uh, obviously the the, the Luvians. Uh, at first, their chief god uh, was the storm god by the name of Tarhu, um, and um, the, the word Tar means to defeat or conquest. Uh, and so Tarhun is often shown holding an axe. Often it's a double-headed axe or even a mace, right? And sometimes, in the other hand, he's holding the triple thunderbolt. Uh, and the sacred animal is always the bull, okay? Uh, another one is Elephantu. He's the exalted son. He's the god of agriculture. Uh, in a sense, he embodies the crops. You have Kamu Sepa. Uh, this is the Luvian Hittite god, uh, goddess, excuse me, of, of healing, of medicine, and magic. Uh, she is the mother of Aruna, and she is part of the Telepanu myth concerning the missing vegetation god, because he goes missing, Telepanu goes missing. According to the story, she enlisted the help of a human to perform a ritual to remove the anger from this angry god. Uh, Telepanu. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in relieving your anger, here's a recipe here. So she used the following ingredients uh, ingredients for her ritual. So here's the ingredients to get rid of anger. Cedar essence, sap, shaft, grain, sesame, figs, olives, grapes, ointment, malt, honey, cream, and oil. Upon the completion of this ritual, she sacrificed 12 rams of the sun gods. And then, of course, Telepanu's anger turned in uh, towards the underworld. I'm not sure uh, if I would want to go through the 12 rams, but there you have it. Uh, Pihasas was another Luvian god of weather and lightning. But there's a goddess 
that's connected to the Luvians. And it is a form that will become later understood as Demeter uh, and is known as Asasara, often called the Madonna of the Luvians. The Asasara is found even uh, within a Minoan context because we, I just want to mention this when it comes to uh, Minoan. Um, so far, we have 1,400 Minoan inscribed clay tablets uh, we, that reveal about 78 hieroglyphic signs that form about 125 words. The good news is that about 15 of these Minoan hieroglyphic signs and 45 of these words we can read because we have Luvian counterparts. So Luvian is helping us understand a little bit. And we see these commonalities, of course, uh, Dimata. Uh, which is Demeter, uh, is amongst them. So we have this goddess, this great goddess of the, the Luvians, of the Lycians. Uh, and also, uh, we take a look, and we also realize that the Luvians are connected uh, to those known as the Dali priests, uh, uh, which is connected to the cult of Kibli. Uh, so, in fact, the center of these ecstatic priests happen to be in the area of, of the southern Luvians. <clears throat> These Luvian uh, priests uh, practice cutting and bloodletting rituals, uh, especially during the festival known as the Istanua. Uh, they use what's called a tympanion. Now it's interesting that the tympanion, which is of course the frame drum, uh, spreads from the Middle East along the southern shore of Anatolia, and then gets the Greeks, and then later on it backtracks into Phrygia, where it is then connected uh, to the Kivali cult. But it's interesting that the Dependian uh, is part of rituals of the Luvians, and of course the Lycians who we're talking about. In fact, there was an act of drinking from the Dependian, uh, which was a custom at that time. Um, uh, Hittite texts tell how the Luvian men of a certain place called Lulupaya drink from what was described as a beautiful, uh, which, uh, so they're drinking literally from a Tapania. Another Italian belief that became a Lycian tradition was the using, was a belief of the strength of rocks around them uh, to represent the strength of the gods. And so what they would do uh, in places in Lycia, like a Patara, they would create rock altars, and these niches cut into the living rock are believed to be connected to the gods. Now, what will happen here, as I said before, is there's a connection between uh, any Mahana with the sanctuary of Musawawa. Uh, and we take a look, and it turns out that the word any Mahana uh, is actually connected. Uh, to Luvian and translates as mother of the gods. So, so basically at the shrine of Mashuala, M-A-S-H-U-I-L-U-W-A, you have a deity known as Eni, E-N-I, uh, Mahana, uh, M-A-H-A-N-A-H-I, <laughs> uh, who uh, also is known as Anis Masanasis, and in Luvian that means mother of the gods. I told you I'm giving you all the specifics. So you have the mother of the gods being worshipped that will later on become understood as Leto and then connected to Artemis. And then that name will spread east and west. And of course, we talked about the derivation of the word Artemis already. Now, uh, any Mahana was, uh, we do have an image discovered at Latum. Again, further connecting modern, well, actually, the tomb that was thrived during the Greek and Roman times uh, with, uh, with this ancient goddess. Uh, at, uh, later on, during the Greek and Roman times, at the Latune, there were three temples that stand there dedicated to Leto and her two children. Okay. Now, Leto was loved by Zeus, but was persecuted, according to the stories, by Hera. And she fled the goddess's wrath. And according to the story, she fled to Patara, 
uh, in Lycia, where she gave birth to twins. Uh, in one story, she's harassed by shepherds at the spring when she tries to have some water. According to Antonius Liberalis in his metaphor, meta Metamorphoses, Leto, after giving birth to Apollo and Artemis on the Isle of Asteria, went to Lycia, taking her children with her to the baths of Xanthos. As soon as she arrived in that land, she came first upon the spring of Melite and wanted very much to bathe her children there before going on to Xanthos. But some herdsmen drove her away so that their own cattle could drink at the spring. Leto made off and left for Melite. Wolves came out to meet her and wagging their tails led the way, guiding her to the river Xanthos. She drank the water and bathed the babes and consecrated Xanthos to Apollo, while the land which had been called Tremelis, she renamed Lycia or wolf land from the wolves that had guided her. Then she returned to the spring to inflict a penalty on the herdsmen who had driven her away. Uh, they were then still washing their cattle besides the spring. Uh, Leto changed them all into frogs whose backs and shoulders she scratched with a rough stone. Throwing them all into the spring, she made them live in the water. To this day, they croak away by rivers and ponds. You know, you don't want to mess with a goddess, uh, especially a goddess like Leto. Uh, she basically turned them all into frogs. That's what they get. Uh, for denying her and her kids some water. There are, there's another story, which I don't have time to talk about, uh, but uh, Ovid in his Metamorphosis also talks about it, but I, I do want to bring up the introduction. He says, uh, in Lycia's fertile fields, once, long ago, the peasants scorn Leto, not unscathed. It's not a thing well known. The men, of course, being low-born louts, but marvelous all the same. I saw with my own eyes, Ovid says, the lake and place famed for the miracle. Uh, so, so Ovid's telling a story that he went to uh, Lycia, and he says, for my old father, too, old by then, too worn to take the road, had charged me to retrieve some special steers and given me a Lycian for a guide. With him, I traversed those far pasture lands when standing in the middle of a, of a mare and black with ash of sacrifice, behold, an ancient altar ringed with waving reeds. So he basically came upon an ancient altar surrounded by reeds. My guide stood still and muttered anxiously, be gracious to me. And I muttered too, be gracious. Then I asked him if the altar was built to Pan or the Naiads or some local god. And he gave this reply. No, uh, my lad, no mountain god enjoys this altar. It is claimed by her, Leto, whom once the queen of heaven, a, a bard from the world, whom drifting Delos scarcely dare consent to harbor, and then basically tells the same story that we heard earlier about turning these people into frogs. <laughs> so, so you do have, again, uh, these ancient connections to Leto. Okay, so... Uh, there you have it. Now, the Lido's name uh, is uh, maybe related to the word Lada. So Lito and Lada, which in Lycian means woman or wife. Now that gets interesting. So wait, Lido is understood not just as woman, but as wife. Are you guys following me? And so the earlier legends could be that it is not Hera who is the wife of Zeus. That's right. Uh, it is Leto who is the wife of Zeus. Ah, I know this, this is like, well, your brain just kind of going, okay, okay, well. And then, of course, if we go back earlier, we have evidence that it is Poseidon uh, and Leto who are together. Because <laughs> what is another story all together. But uh, there you go. Again, I know the mind is just going, wow. Now, of course, Apollo, uh, as I said, is also Anatolian god that's adopted by the Greeks in both myth and ritual. Uh, he is summoned to return to Greece. In the Iliad, Homer mentions Apollo as Phobos, 
which means illuminated, as well as the, quote, the famous Lycian archer Apollo. So wait, so Apollo, along with his Anatolian sister Artemis, were the ones on the side of the Trojans. Once again, so now he's bringing in another. So, so another, so, so Apollo and Artemis are Luvian gods. Got it? Now what happens is that Artemis is considered to be the continuation of the mother goddess religion under a new name. Got it? So what will happen now? Uh, oh, I want to mention one other thing just for fun. I want to mention that in Lycia, do you have a place called Telemosos? I've been there, uh, which was famous for its soothsayers who were dedicated to Apollo and were said to be very important uh, throughout the ancient world. So the center of prophecy uh, in connection to Apollo was also the Lycian areas. Now, uh, we also have, I won't spend too much time on this, but there's also Apollo's sister Artemis uh, had a cult center at Myra, which is another Lycian city. And it is also connected specifically to Artemis Elothea or Elothera, which, by the way, is the name of the Minoan gods. Again, that's a whole other talk, but I will just make it very clear <laughs> that you have another site. And here you have this name Artemis connected directly to a Minoan goddess directly. Uh, this temple uh, dedicated at Myra. It was magnificent, but was destroyed partly in 141 CE, a little bit rebuilt. And then, you know, who actually destroyed uh, this uh, temple in the end? <laughs> Santa Claus. I <laughs> got your attention. What? Old Saint Nick? Yeah. So what happens is Saint Nicholas, uh, the Bishop of Myra, <laughs> who later becomes associate with Santa Claus, was very zealous. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, uh, he arrived at this temple, according to stories of Artemis, uh, and destroyed it. So there you have it. Uh, now, uh, other things about uh, the Lycians that we'll find interesting here, that goes way back when, is that it was a custom for men in ancient Lycia uh, to have their hair long. I mean, we're talking long and sometimes shoulder length. So again, a connection to this ancient past. Uh, so we see this in various uh, places. Um, uh, for example, Polyanus. He notes that a man named Cherimenes managed to escape across Lycia by putting on false hair. What does that mean? He's putting on false hair so he looks like a, another Lycian. That's how he gets away. Uh, there's also the Oceanomica. Uh, tells the story of Mazdas taxing for the hair length of the Lycians. <laughs> so how, you know, Mazdas, you know, as in the mausoleum, a Heliconarsis, right? You know, the famous, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Actually, we had a tax <laughs> on the Lycians uh, since they, you know, for their hair. Because they want to keep their hair. Want to keep your hair. You got to pay for it. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, we also find a long-haired Lycians in relief sculptures, uh, for example, a sarcophagus from Limra, uh, and uh, in a silver vase, also in the British Museum. So, yeah, there you have it. And so, interestingly enough, are there other sources that talk about the fact uh, that uh, they wore greaves and corslets, the men? They carry bows of cornel wood. Uh, uh, they, some, uh, they sometimes had a goat skin slung around their shoulders and hats that were stuck with a bunch of feathers. And they carried daggers and rip hooks, according to Herodotus. So, an interesting folk, aren't they? <laughs> so, they're wearing long hair, right? Uh, and goat skins you know, slung around their shoulders, right? And, 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 uh, and hats with feathers. <laughs> Is up. So, so I would say that the, the Lycians uh, who are, 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 you know, are pretty um, interesting. So what will happen is, as I said before, the Lycians uh, who are the Luca, uh, they enter, they're part of, of the culture of Amphilia all the way up and inclusive of the city of Perge. Got it?
glucose. So now we have that connection. So good, good. Now, so now we can focus on purgate. So we realize that when we talk about pamphylia, in the, case, in the case of purgate, because it's on that river and it's on the on the on the uh, western side of that river, uh, the Kestris River, we know that it is still Luca land, which is Lycian land, which is connected to that culture that I just described. And we also know that since it is connected to Artemis, the Artemis that is worshipped there and venerated is connected to the Artemis that we just talked about, who is the great mother of gods, right? Uh, uh, in in a in a Lycia, in places like Latun, Xanthos, and other places. You guys got it. So I've made the link. You know, <laughs> and I always have to draw a chart or a diagram. So let's go a little bit further here. Uh, let's talk about purgate. Uh, so time for some water. We're we're going to get further down the rabbit hole, and we're going to go way further. So this is going to be, but it's going to be a lot of fun now. We got the whole basis here. So Perge is located on the fertile Pamphylian plain uh, by the Castros River. Uh, uh, most scholars agree that the earliest settlement of Perge was located on the Acropolis. Uh, in fact, it was occupied as early as the Calcolithic era. So, uh, you know, 4,500 to 3,500 BCE. What's really interesting is that there are natural springs. And I've been up there. I've been up to the Acropolis. Natural springs located at the very top of the terrace. Uh, and the water still today pours down uh, various places around the hill. Uh, of course, there's porous limestone around, so sometimes it just kind of bleeds out of the rock. Uh, during this era, those living in the ancient Perge worshipped a goddess, as I mentioned. Uh, and that uh, uh, connects to the goddess of the Lycians, but uh, with a little bit of a different variation. So the goddess was named in this case, but it still has the same attributes, Wanasa Pre, Wanasa Pre, which translates as Lady Perge. Now, what's interesting is the word lady, you know, Wanasa, uh, if you know, and I'm sure many of you do know, uh, uh, the ancient Mycenaeans, a name for a king in ancient Mycenaean, which are Greeks, is known as a wanax. So a wanasa could be understood as a lady, but could also be understood as a queen. So it could be Lady Perge, or the goddess is known as Queen Perge. Okay, so, uh, so we can see here, uh, even though it is a Luvian, Luca, Lycian goddess <laughs> connected to the Western realm, we still can see a Greek Mycenaean overlay. Now we take a look at the at the pottery, and we find cryptogeometrical pottery dates from the ninth or eighth century BCE. So there seems to be a kind of a gap. Um, the problem is with, I, I won't go too much into the archaeology, but the problem is the top part of the Acropolis is really eroded away. We'll go into that. And so we, in some places, we've lost some of the levels. And in other places, the material culture has been messed with. But anyway, one of the earliest associations of someone uh, specifically uh, connected to Artemis of Perge uh, by name, uh, and her name was Damphili. Damphili, or Damophile, lived in the 7th into the 6th centuries BCE. Now, you do want to pay attention to this, right? So Damophile, or Philae, uh, D-A-M-O-P-H-Y-L-E. Uh, according to this, uh, she, she was a female poet, and she composed hymns sung in honor of Artemis of Perge. And she did that in the Aeolian and the Pamphylian modes. Now, so she was a lyric poetess of Pamphylia. And you know who she was a companion of? She was actually the pupil and companion of Sappho. Yes, the famous Sappho. You know, uh, you know who thrived around 611 BCE. And like Sappho, uh, this she instructed other ladies 
she also composed erotic poems and hymns. Now, uh, the, the person who connects uh, Sappho uh, with, with Demophile uh, was Philostratus. And uh, in fact, uh, he uses an interesting verb that connects her. Um, the word is homoleo. So the word homoleo can be referred to as to be a pupil of, but it also could mean somebody who has sexual intercourse. And so it is used in connection with Sappho. So she was sometimes, it's either maybe a pupil of her or, or a very close companion, or another context is that they were lovers. Wow. So once again, we have this connection with empowered women, right? Early on in Perge, we're going to see this later on too. This is just part of the culture of this area. And uh, she thrives during this period. So uh, the student or companion or lover of Sappho, uh, she ends up in Perge. So I think that's, uh, to me, is, is pretty interesting. Now, we take a look here uh, on the flat summit of the western hill of the Acropolis. Uh, we find that there's a cult building that dates from the 6th century BCE. And then uh, Perge returns to history as a Pamphylian Greek city. Uh, when the Persians arrive, then the Athenians, and then the Persians again. In fact, uh, the name uh, the, uh, uh, on the Athenian tribute list, Perge is included with an unknown tribute uh, in 425 BCE. Perge then starts to gain its reputation as a place for the worship of Artemis. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, Pseudo Silex makes a reference to the sanctuary of Artemis of Perge around the year 360 BCE. He states as follows. If you proceed upward from the sea, there is then Phasalus, a city with a harbor. And this is a gulf. And Idiros, a city, the island of uh, Lernatia, and Olbia, Magolus, and Perge, a city with a sanctuary of Artemis. And of course, he goes on. So it's so the city of Perge is, when he's going through this list of cities of Pamphylia, it's immediately associated with its temple. Uh, this is the same thing we're going to see with, with uh, Artemis of the Ephesians uh, and the city of Ephesus. So there you have it. So you do have the Hellenization of Pamphylia, but there's still a very strong native non-Hellenistic element uh, in the local population that we can see, especially through uh, the inscriptions with the local names, which are again Luvian or, or Lycian, right? So, uh, and she was understood very much as Wanasa Pre, which I mentioned before as lady or the queen of Perge. Uh, we see that uh, she is honored in, in um, <clears throat> um, one inscription by a man named Kalmuts, son of Laramos, uh, which is, again is a Luvian name. And so there you have it. So what happens is that um, slowly but surely, the lady of Perge, or queen Perge, will be identified with Artemis, and they will start to share some of the same, well, obviously will be shown or revealed as sharing the same uh, attributes. Uh, we found also uh, there's a stele devoted to Artemis uh, Perge. Uh, it's a limestone, dates from the second half of the fourth century BCE. Uh, and um, it also testifies, and it is from mainland Greece. That's what's interesting. So we now we have the spread of the worship of Artemis of Perge, and it's starting to spread all around the Mediterranean. So it's not just going to be a Perge here in mainland Greece. We're going to see it uh, at a place called Ambremica, uh, sorry, Ambremsia, excuse me, on the northern western coast of Greece. Artemis of uh, Perge was worshipped there as well. Uh, so we have that. Uh, another place uh, in, uh, in Egypt, at Nocritus, in the fourth century, we have another place where Artemis of, Apol of, of Perge is worshipped. So the spread now of the worship is, is happening uh, throughout the Mediterranean. 
So then Alexander the Great arrives, uh, and he occupied Perge with part of his army. Uh, and then, of course, you have Seleucids to take over. And during this time, around 190, the lower city is fortified by the Seleucids. And now you have one of the founders mentioned as Mopsus, as well as Calchas of Perge, which we find in earlier myths. During this period of time, the lower city streets were organized in a consistent manner. Uh, the Greek poet Polemicus in the third century BCE uh, writes in his hymn three to Artemis. He actually mentions Artemis of Perge, declaring, which now of islands finds most favor with the Artemis? What city of cities of Perge in Pamphylia, unquote. During the third century BC, the cult of Perge, Artemis Perge continued to spread into the Mediterranean. Uh, and um, in fact, um, we have an interesting text here. That I'm going to bring up uh, that is um, there is what's called the Union of Pergastai in Lindos on the island of Rhodes. There was an association connected to Artemis of Perge. Now, this is on a slab of marble, uh, and it does mention a group devoted to Artemis of Perge uh, at this time. And so I have the document, but I won't, won't read it here. But uh, I actually have it in Greek as well. Other sites, in, including uh, worshiping of Perge, includes Thera, Ambrakea, and, uh, and a few others as well, Arisonites. Uh, so there you have it. So what's going to happen now uh, is in, in Perge, you have another famous individual. His name is Artemidorus, son of Apollonus. Uh, and, um, and of course, um, uh, we have here, uh, it's interesting here, uh, is that um, uh, he has an inscription. He leaves an inscription. So basically this Artemidorus, he leaves Perge uh, in Pamphylia on the southern coast of Asia Minor, uh, and he goes to the island of Thera. And uh, we find he leaves an inscription on Thera, and it goes as follows. It says, to Artemis Soterea of Perge. Now, already, okay, uh, what I find is interesting here is the word Soterea means savior. Uh, so, this is the, so there could be perhaps a mystery cult connected, connected already to Artemis of Perge uh, by this period of time, uh, you know, during the time of the, uh, of the first half of the second century uh, BCE. But he says, to Artemis Soterea of Perge, Artemidorus, son of Apollonius of Perge, Artemis prophesied for Artemidorus 90 years of life. And pronea, which means forethought, added another three to it. So, so basically, we have this Artemidorus uh, who's dedicating this, this, this altar uh, to Artemidorus, thanking her for his long lifespan of night, you know, and that, uh, and that uh, he heard in a prophecy before from her that he would live for 90 years. And so he's thanking her, saying, Guess what? Thank you so much. I not only lived 90 years, but I lived three more years, 93 years. Thank you so much. There's obviously clearly uh, a connection uh, here between the two. Now, we do have coins starting to be minted of Artemis of Perge. <clears throat> and uh, at first, uh, it appears to have a very Hellenistic end. At first. And this reflects a Greek and Hellenistic interpretation of the image. Uh, but this is going to change as time goes on. So at first, it's kind of superficial. It connects to the, um, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the Hellenistic influence. <clears throat> We're going to see later on, it's going to change into an exotic natal. It's kind of strange image that I uh, posted online a little bit. By the way, during this time, there's another famous uh, individual from Perge. His name is Apollonius of Perge. He's a famous mathematician and astronomer who lived in the late third and early second centuries uh, BCE. Uh, and uh, he brought together the ideas of Euclid and Archimedes 
and clarified them, especially when it comes to ellipses and parabolas and so forth. Anyway, uh, in 190 BCE, the Romans, as I said, defeated the Seleucids. In 188 BCE, a Seleucid garrison, still at Perge, was expelled by Manilus, the Romans. And then he, of course, it says he, then he led the troops toward Perge, which alone in this district was held by a royal garrison. As he approached, the commander of the garrison met him, asking for a truce of 30 days in order that he might consult King Antiochus about surrendering the city. Well, so around 188 BCE, Perge came under Roman rule, and in 129 BCE, it formally became part of the province of Asia. So we get to the first century BCE, and we have the famous geographer Strabo, and in his geography, he writes as follows. The Kestros River in Caphilia, he mentions, and sailing 60 stadia up this river, one comes to Perge, a city, and near Perge on a lofty site to the temple of Artemis Pergea, where a general festival is celebrated every year. Now, it's interesting because we still have not found the great temple of Perge. I have an idea where it is. I'll give a hint at the end of the topic, the talk today, but we still do not know. But you can see here from this description, it says, and near Perge on a lofty site to the temple of Artemis Perge. So this site is near Perge, and it's on a lofty site. But which lofty site? Now, according to Cicero, right in the first century BCE, the sanctuary of Artemis of Perge was famous for its riches, causing many to want to steal away from its treasures. Uh, one, his name is Varus, was unfortunately successful in stealing from this temple. Uh, Cicero declares, at Perge, we are aware that there is a very ancient and very holy temple of Diana. That too, I say, was stripped and plundered by you, and all the gold which there was on Diana herself was taken off and carried away. What in the name of mischief can such audacity and insanity mean, he says. Uh, by the way, it was also kind of an inside job because Cicero, uh, apparently there was somebody who helped out. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a doctor by the name of Artemidorus who acted in Varus's uh, case to help out uh, with this great debt. Now, what happens is when the Romans create the province known as Galatia in central Anatolia around 25 BCE, uh, the Romans decided to connect it to the coast of the Mediterranean, and a new road known as the Via Sebast was constructed, linking Pisidian Antioch in Galatia with Perge and Pamphylia. And so now uh, it becomes, uh, Perge is the direct route, there's a direct road going to the sea. Uh, so it becomes even more important. As for coinage, the traditional Artemis uh, form still appears during this period of time in the second to the first centuries BCE. But things are gonna to start to change as time goes on. In fact, uh, so in fact, um, what happens is that during the first century BCE, we find that there's a bronze coin and Artemis now is sitting within a triangular niche and is crowned with a round headdress and has a distinct head, but once at but once you get to the body, it appears to be a dato or a block-like in form, definitely not based upon any Greek form. So what's going to happen is that the indigenous goddess and her form is starting to leak into the local coinage. We see this also when it comes to the exotic Artemis of the Ephesians, the same kind of thing. The early coinage so it shows Artemis looking just like, you know, Artemis, uh, the goddess of the moon and hunt, its eggs and so forth, although you see the bee connection. But eventually it will become the polymastic, the multi breasted uh, you know, Artemis of the Ephesians. You're going to see the same kind of thing, that uh, the Artemis uh, Perge is going to become increasingly more exotic, of Greek, especially the lower part. In fact, uh, it looks like that this image is on a plinth uh, in many cases. And you see more coins. Eventually, you're going to see this Artemis Perge looking more exotic. 
within a two-columned shrine with an eagle and a pediment with wings spread above. <clears throat> and of course, we see uh, on the reverse, uh, we, we see the quiver of Artemis, uh, but uh, we also see um, that the head of Artemis, by the way, it looks like a stone, and in many cases, it looks like a meteorite. In fact, many of the coins that we see, it's a very strange looking stone, very roughly hewn, which had led many scholars to believe uh, that the stone, uh, that the, the Artemis of Perge is connected to a stone that fell out of heaven. And then later on, this idea of this stone or image that fell out of heaven will be connected to Artemis of the Ephesians, and then will be mentioned, of course, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles uh, in the Bible uh, that uh, connected to Artemis of the Ephesians, uh, you know, the image which fell from heaven. We also have, of course, a Hittite connection uh, with the star that falls in the Spasis, which is Ephesus. Uh, so, so once again, you're going to have these connections of images falling to heaven. And of course, uh, Artemis of Perge may very well have this connection, right? So in the Roman period, coins continue to show the Perge and Artemis in her temple in the form of a block of stone. Uh, in fact, more and more, she has less resemblance to a human figure. And in some cases, she just becomes a rock that has a lot of votive niches. You know, so you have the exotic mysterium of Artemis of the of her day uh, being emphasized, right? Now, uh, again, <clears throat> we have to take a look here that uh, uh, as, as time goes on, I have to, of course, move along here a little bit. Um, uh, here we go. Uh, so we take a look and, um, sorry, I'm skipping pages here. Uh, oh, yeah. One of the images, uh, lower part of the cult image, we see that's that extent, uh, is divided into two completely flat stripes, underneath of which are remnants of a third one. In between are narrow stripes. In the uppermost zone, there's a seven long sleeve, probably all female figures appear in the bottom. Uh, there are six of them. We see here in, in this image a cathera player and other musical instruments. So it does appear that you have uh, a depiction of the worshipers around uh, Perge. Oh, of course, all of them uh, having uh, very long hair. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, we see an image. Um, uh, we also see that uh, under the chin of the goddess, there's like an acorn chain. Uh, which seems to be reminiscent of Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, of course, uh, Perge, I won't go too much into this, uh, will be connected again to the book, uh, the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible. Uh, I'll just say this briefly, that the book of Acts describes three journeys of the Apostle Paul made in Asia Minor. Uh, before arriving in Perge on the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas visited the island of Cyprus, which is the home of Barnabas. John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, accompanied them. After preaching at Salamis, they traveled to the provincial home, uh, capital, excuse me, Apophos, where they met the Roman governor, Sergius Paulus, uh, whose actual home was visiting in Antioch. And it may it was the suggestion that the apostles decided to go to visit in Antioch. But when they crossed the way uh, from Cyprus, they arrived, according to the story, at Perge. However, one of the members of their party was not happy with the change of direction. Uh, and uh, when they reached Perge, John Mark left Paul and Barnabas and returned to Jerusalem. So you have uh, this story here. So Christianity does arrive uh, during this period of time. Uh, the uh, Perge is being built up. Uh, you have the famous palestra of Claudius being built uh, later on. Roman baths are being built. Uh, the Emperor Titus also does quite a bit of constructions uh, as well. Uh, but, um, but you have somebody that's very important. <clears throat> and her name is Plancia Magna, uh, who came from a very distinguished family of Perge. Uh, she was, uh, in fact, uh, uh, she was the daughter of the Roman senator, proconsul Marcus Plantius Verus. 
and the daughter of the Herodian princess, as in the Jewish princess, Julia. Her mother, who is a was a Jewish princess from the Herodian, as in King Herod's line, came to Perge and became a priestess of Artemis of Perge. So she went from she apostatized from Judaism and became a worshiper of Artemis Perge, uh, and she served the temple of uh, there. And so uh, later on, of course, obviously her daughter then became a priestess of Artemis Perge, uh, and uh, then became the top priestess. And again, this is fascinating because uh, she became, she was incredibly wealthy. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, due to her goodness and generosity, uh, what happened is that she, in a sense, became a second calendar of her game. She, you know, she was known for her uh, civic mindedness of uh, being very charitable. And uh, she dedicated herself to the beautification uh, and the development of her game. Uh, so, uh, so very important lady. Uh, she worked, for example, on the Hellenistic Gate in the Horseshoe Courtyard there, and we find various inscriptions dedicated to her. But her prestige, a lot of it comes from uh, her connection to Artemis of Perge. Uh, she had the title of High Priestess of the Temple uh, and uh, uh, the Goddess Artemis of Perge. Um, one surviving inscription at the base uh, from a statue erected by the, the community of Perge, uh, says as follows. Plantia Magna, daughter of Marcus Plantius Verus, and daughter of the city, priestess of Artemis, and both first and sole public priestess of the mother of gods for the duration of her life, pious and patriotic. Uh, we see that, uh, uh, so very important lady, during the second century CE, the theater Perge received a refit. Um, it was rebuilt. And we see in the theater, in the central section, a frieze showing Artemis Pergea holding a cornucopia in her left hand and her right hand, a cult statue. On either side, there are figures of old priests bringing bowls for a sacrifice. Artemis uh, is portrayed as a patron of Perge. Uh, in a very long relief in showing this sacrifice. So uh, there you have that too. So uh, very, very prominent in various ways. Now, um, I do want to say a few other things uh, before we go uh, too much further. And I do want to go a little further, but um, I'm looking at my time and I know it's, it's pretty short. Um, I would, would just say a few things. Um, there are I'm going to generalize a few things. We do have, and I don't have time uh, to go through all the details because I have to leave in a very quick sense. Um, we do have evidence, actually inscriptional evidence, uh, of a very active cult of per day. But what I find is so interesting about this cult uh, is that uh, all of them all the people who are worshipers happen to be women. Uh, in fact, in many cases, men are excluded uh, from these lists uh, of worshipers, which I find, again, uh, is a fascinating case. So in fact, I'm going to go ahead. Maybe I'll, I'll go to that source uh, if I can even find it here. Uh, maybe we'll be able to find it. Yeah, okay, won't be able to find it this way because it's buried. I have about 40 some pages of materials. So that's quite a bit. Um, actually, oh, yeah, maybe I do have, okay. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go ahead. I found actually a few of these sources here. Um, okay, well, yeah, so here's, okay, so. What happens here? I got the source. Wow, I found it. <laughs> All these pages, right? Um, we have, I want to make sure we get to this point, because uh, this is kind of important. And this is new materials. So we take a look. 
And I'm going to go back, not too far back here. And I'm going to tell you where I think the temple is. And then we'll close up. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, okay, so you're going to have uh, the, 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 the priestess, a high priestess of Artemis was, was a priestess for life, right? And she was responsible for all private and public sacrifices. And on each new moon, it is said in the inscription, she must take a sacrifice for the health of the city. We know that as a priestess, she was not required to be celibate, but could marry and have children. And this was never deemed as distracting from her obligations. But uh, she, according to the inscriptions, she received a choice piece from each victim offered in the public sacrifice. Uh, and that included a thigh and the shares given in addition to the thigh. Uh, as far as the collection procedure in connection to the priestesses of Artemis Perge at Halconarsis, so this is another place uh, where they're worshiping uh, Artemis Perge, Halconarsis, it was similar uh, to was also observed at the island of Kos. And accordingly, we find inscriptions that each year on the 12th of the month called Heraclion, the priestess of Perge celebrates the general official sacrifice for which the Pertanists are responsible, but whose execution is entrusted, I'm going to go slow here, is entrusted to the, quote, the wives of the magistrates. Let's pause here. So according to this inscription, every year on the 12th of the month called Heraclion, the priest is the per Perge celebrates a great sacrifice, right? Uh, for which the Pertanists are responsible. Pertanists is kind of like the, the local civic head, right? But whose execution is entrusted to the wives of the magistrates. So it is, so it's not the men who are doing the sacrifice, but it is their wives who are doing the sacrifice. Uh, now the status, the, the, the statute, calls for an equal share for the priestess and the wives of the pretenis responsible for the sacrifice. So that means the partaking, uh, this is equal, this is equal. So the women are to share together instead of their husbands, a portion of the meat. So this is only for them, right? Now, this is interesting. So the affair is played out at another level. Surrounding the priestess of Artemis Perge, women, as we see from the inscriptions, occupy the entire sacrificial area. This is huge. Now remember, the sacrifice is not just to Artemis of Perge within the, any given city. This is a political sacrifice connected directly to the local city. And usually it is the men that are involved in a political sacrifice. Well, guess what? With Artemis of Perge, it is the women. Uh, so, uh, so now <clears throat> that means that uh, obviously uh, the divine power granted powers to women in the form of the priesthood as well as the ritual, right? Female citizenship also comes out as a result of the festivals. So there's a focus on women being citizens within each in, in, in given city during these rituals. Uh, it is a collective public festival embodying not only the political and religious aspect, but it is under a women. I know you're kind of looking at me like, what's the big deal? This is a big deal, right? Uh, this is very unusually egalitarian, uh, this right for women to do be involved in the ritual slaughter and sharing of animal victims, uh, because, and this also shows these women within this context of Artemis of Perge exercising real power within not only the religious sphere, but the, uh, the uh, uh, political sphere as well. In fact, uh, at Perge itself, women 
I had the right to sacrifice together, to divide the victims up amongst themselves, and they did so in broad daylight before the eyes of the, the assembled uh, city. Why, why are you saying, Dr. Rico, before uh, in broad daylight? Well, you guys know the, uh, the, the Thesmophoria, right? The, the, you know, uh, no male eye, eyes were tolerated, and the women were set aside. You know, they were they, they did these rituals and sacrifices not within the city, but out in the country, out in the fields, right? This great ecstatic celebration. Well, when it comes to Artemis of Perge, this worship is done within the civic setting, within the political setting. Now, granted, when it comes to the cult of Artemis of, of the Ephesians, you kind of have a, a combination. What they did is they split the worship, and and so of Artemis into two. You had the Britannus side within the city, and most of those were men who are the officials. Although the Britannus, who was at the top, was oftentimes a woman, but the rest, those who were doing the sacrifices, were men. And then you had uh, another group uh, connected to the Temple of Artemis directly, and yes, a large part of them are women. However, those who are sacrificing are still men. In this case, it's women in all those cases. Isn't that fascinating? Well, um, now Artemis of Perge was also associated with giving messages in one's dreams. Uh, and so uh, there was a certain Artemidorus of Naldus. He lived in the second century CE. And he relates how Artemis uh, of Ephesia as well as Artemis Perge, as well as the Lycian goddess Eleutheria, are all connected to one's dreams. Uh, and so you can see them appear and give you various messages, uh, which I think is, is fascinating. So um, anyway, so there you go. He says, um, all right. So um, now by the time we get to um, Antonius Pius. Now the coins <laughs> depicting Artemis of Perge, they're really exotic. It's just basically a segmented box-like design <laughs> with seven sequences on it. Uh, and so, as you know, I find it's interesting. Now you do have it kind of revert back of uh, periods of time, but you're going to see that as Artemis of Perge uh, goes along, the exotic indigenous features really do uh, connect, or I should say, reestablish itself. Now, um, uh, what we're going to do here is I'm, I'm finishing up, and I'm, I have a list of coins, and I would just say that uh, these exotic coins continue for a very long time. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, for example, this one is interesting here. Uh, it is a betel appearing to be a square-shaped stone with a rounded top, having a head of Artemis, not directly on the top, but inserted a little further down on the stone with a tall headdress that widens out at the top. Three distinct levels are visible on the surface of the stone uh, with what appears to be various figures inserted with possible uh, square shelves. Uh, maybe it looks like there's a moon that's connected to it. Sorry, this is, this is a... Um, uh, uh, this is on a coin, but we also see the exact same representation as in carving as as well. Well, as time goes on, unfortunately, uh, these ideas uh, start to fade, uh, and the city itself uh, loses revenue uh, and disappears. And of course, during the Christian era, uh, we see uh, many of these inscriptions uh, being uh, cut out. And uh, there's obviously examples of mutilation. Now, let's let's, let's conclude. So, Artemis of Perge. One last thing. Where's this temple? Where's this great temple of Artemis of Perge? Now, yes, I became obsessed. <laughs> I'm gonna find the temple. You know, uh, help find the Ortigas site in Ephesus. By gum and by golly, I'm going to go ahead and try to find the temple of Artemis of Perge. 
And so I got to Perga. I've been there a few times, as I said. I got to Perga, and I said, well, you know, Strabo mentions it's a high place and that uh, uh, it's it's connected to the city. You can kind of see them as one. And there's something that's natural because when you arrive at Perga, uh, you go through the gates, you go down, there's this great colonnaded uh, roadway. At the very end, there's this fountain. It's kind of cool. It's still there. This fountain with the um, the fountain, the bed of the fountain, the, the pool going down the center of the road. It's actually a place uh, for, the, for the water from that fountain to go down and fill up this pool that goes in the center of the colonnaded road, which must have been absolutely beautiful. Now, behind it uh, is this hill, this porous hill, uh, where the springs run forth, and where there is a, uh, you know, it's an Acropolis, and where they thought the city first began. Yeah, I went up there, looked around. I found a Byzantine basilica. I found some earlier buildings. Uh, some of them um, were, looked like they were, you know, temples dedicated to various gods or goddesses. But I could not find anything that would support a monolithic temple of Artemis. Ah. So, walked around and I did some studies and I also consulted um, some, some German sources as well, trying to figure out where this is. And I noticed something very strange. That is, is that, is that uh, you have roads. Earlier on, there is a road that connects the Acropolis directly with the river. It's kind of strange because you would think that, you know, there's a little port by the river, the Castro's River, and you would think that the road would go directly to the city of Perge itself, you know, uh, uh, for commerce reasons. But why is there a road that goes directly to the Acropolis, as you know, on the side, as opposed to the city? And that hit me a little strange. So it's, a, it's kind of a prominent road, too. So why would there be so much need for a prominent road to go uh, to the side of the, the Acropolis. And uh, it could be that it was leading towards a temple, the Temple of Perga. If it did so, I thought to myself, then there's a possibility. This is one possibility. It's not the only possibility. And that is there was a temple of Artemis on the Acropolis, but that part of the Acropolis where it stood fell away. It, it crashed in. I see some evidence that something, that there was an erosion, there was something. Remember, there's, there's three, there's the springs up there and the water is pouring down. So it is possible, I'm just saying, it is possible that the reason why we can't fire it on top uh, is that that section of the, of the, the tabletop, uh, that is this Acropolis, had caved in in ancient times perhaps under the weight of this ancient temple. Now, uh, I am the only one that I know that has proposed this. <laughs> but looking at this, I'm like, well, why else is there a big road there leading to nothing? <laughs> you know, the rock face. So that's a possibility. But there's also some hill be beyond that. That uh, uh, There's one by the theater uh, that I am in as another possibility. Uh, but as of yet, uh, it is still a mystery. Now, remember, this was a very famous temple, not as famous as the Temple of Artemis, but famous nevertheless. So, if you're interested in ancient mysteries and wishing for or hoping for something to be, you know, magnificent to be found, maybe uh, you want to focus in on discovering this ancient temple of Perge. And I'm hoping that it exists, and I'm hoping that I'm wrong. That the temple did just kind of crumble down the hill <laughs> and was pulled away. Uh, but who knows? At the same time, another interesting factor I want to kind of bring into this conversation is the fact that you have an ancient legacy. I want to make sure we make this connection. Here you have this goddess goes all the way back, you know, all the way back to the great Anatolian goddess. 
and then through the Luvians, one group specifically those known as the Luca, who are known as the Lycians, right? Um, this uh, this goddess will then morph uh, from the various wonderful Gubali god names uh, into this Leto and into this Artemis. And then, of course, this worship spreads to, or as part of, I should say, part of the worship of Pergame. They are connected. But what is noteworthy is that there seems to be preserved in this worship the ancient Anatolian egalitarian ways within that worship, that women were esteemed within the cult of Perge. And I gave you so much evidence for that. I had more to, but I, you know, it gets trying at times to go through all these inscriptions. There's so much evidence to show that women uh, were, were completely equal within this belief system, if not having a measure more, doing something that is unusual in ancient times. But also, as a result of the worship of Artemis of Perge, it's interesting to note the few other women of Perge that I did not talk about, but it's interesting to note that there is an unusually high amount of very important women to also come out of Perge. Uh, and, uh, you know, and uh, who were great leaders and uh, who helped build up the city and uh, were patrons. Uh, and yet that patronage is still in context of three of those individuals directly connected to Artemis of Perge. And so there we have it, some evidence of ancient beliefs. What I'm hoping is that there will be further studies on Artemis of Perge in this area where we can discover more writings, more inscriptions, so we can go further to put together this ancient belief system from scratch. And that's going to be quite a challenge. And so this is why this particular talk uh, is really new and cutting edge and needs more further investigation. And that's where I'm at. So thank you so much. Uh, I will be here for a few more questions, a few questions, and then I'll be off. Uh, um, thank you so much. A lot of materials. <laughs> Any questions? No questions. I guess Any, you covered everything. Any answers? <laughs> yes, I think the temple was a floating temple. It's a floating temple. Right, because the road led to the river. Bring a doom. No, more like, you know, the, the gambling ships on the <laughs> Mississippi. It just, it just, it just, you know, maybe this is one of those great moments where, you know, you know, the age is changing, people are no longer believing, and the temple rises up uh -huh. and then floats into the heavens. <laughs> back in the image that's fallen from heaven, uh, it has returned back once again. So yeah, maybe that's what happened. Everybody's like, oh, it's a spaceship. Oh, no. <laughs> Aliens. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts? I know you're not too excited about the crashing in this gigantic temple into the, the valley below, but you know, <laughs> there is a lot of stuff that's there, though, unfortunately. So I don't know. Did you uh, ask the question if she's actually Greek or not? Like, if, if so she's not Greek. <laughs> not Greek. And yeah, we answered that question. That they had in Greece or anything like that. So, yeah, so what happens, yeah, she's not, I mean, what happens is this, is that she is definitely uh, a indigenous Anatolian goddess that has a very faint uh, guild of a Greek goddess on top of her. That is, that doesn't, that's, that's really just like Artemis of the Ephesians. And so when the Greeks see her, they will interpret her from their perspective and add those attributes on it. 
But when it comes to the indigenous peoples who live there, who worship her, uh, she retains that ancient heart, which is also true for the worshipers of, of Artemis of the Ephesians. Still retains that. You have some outer features that are Greek, but its heart still beats Anatolia. So, and the interesting thing is the Artemis in general, the, I, the word, the concept comes not from Greece, but out of Asia Minor. And that's significant. And that means we're going to rewrite a lot of books, you know, because you're going to see a lot of books. We'll talk about the bear. Well, there's bear. It's like Ian Thrace. It's like, really? People didn't think that at the time. <laughs> you know, at the time, you know, even, even the time of the Iliad, right? They're, they're, they're connecting Artemis with Lycia, the Lycians. You know, anybody who's read the Iliad knows that. <laughs> so the Greeks obviously uh, look up the Iliad. You get my point. So they know better <laughs> that Artemis is, is essentially uh, Anatolian. And Apollo, too. <laughs> you know, so many Greek legends talk about Apollo coming from the same region. So uh, so we, we need to do some rewriting. Uh, and uh, what has happened is that as Artemis and the idea of Artemis enters into Greece, they will ad adapt Artemis to their local gods and goddesses. But if we're looking at the point of where does it start, it isn't Greece. It's Anatolia. Hmm. Any other questions? Well, like I said, you know, this talk is to me, even though it's going to destroy at times, even for me, mm -hmm. it is it is still probably more revolutionary than any of the other talks. Because this this one changes the paradigm, makes a difference. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think we see here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, at Leros Island, Greece, there is our remnants of a temple which is called both Temple Diana and a Temple of Artemis. Yeah. So you have this course. The concept is the Diana aspect, which is Latin, you know. <coughs> and then of course the Artemis, which is which is we thought was Greek, but no longer Greek. But it's combining in this case. Uh, the, the Anatolian now understood as Greek with the Roman uh, goddess. So, yeah, like I said, this is, you can see also the measure of women performing these sacrifices and the materials going out to the mothers. I mean, think about what that would look like visually and how unusual that is, you know, because in Greek culture, women, uh, you know, yeah, they, they go off into the woods, into the wilds, right? We're talking in the heart of the city. <laughs> you know, this is different. This is it's unusual. And it goes against uh, so much of classical culture. That's why, again, I find this as a very important talk. Because they have this remnant. Yeah. He is on through the same worship. <clears throat> All right. So anyway, kind of makes you want to go to art to uh, Perge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, go to Perge. When you were talking about um, Metropolis, how there used to be a temple, there was probably a lot more to that whole place back in, back when it was first built. Yeah. Because a lot of that's a lot of buildings have just fallen. It probably did. A lot of it probably did just erode away, more likely. Yeah, when I went when I went to the, the Acropolis uh, at, at Perge, when I was going through it, and then I, I had. Uh, the you know I had German only in German. By the way, this is this stuff. Majority of this is not in the English language. That's another problem. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the majority of my sources are in German? So the Germans are the are the ones who are excavating there, or the Turks are are, are excavating there, but not the English language. So oh, okay. so so that's going to keep us out, which is unfortunate. <clears throat> so you have to yeah. know German. So I, I had this German guide, uh, to, you know, show me on top of the Acropolis. And you're right, there was, there was, no, you're, you're right there, there was, there was ancient sites in certain places, but, mm -hmm. but you're, you're very shrewd because the thing is, is there are other places where it looked like it had been wiped clean. Material yeah. culture had been wiped. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, I remember there, there are springs there, there's on top of the hill, and that it, it, got, it got really wet and slippery. I got to tell you that I fell. 
I kind of went down the a little creepy. Yeah. I don't describe it as like real not fun. <laughs> you know, yeah. Hang up and uh, but uh, but but because there's erosion through the water, that's also going to uh, make the material culture a little bit mushy uh, yeah. and erode away yeah. a little bit of the top as well. But there's one yeah. area where I went where just like it seems like it seems like it should have keep keep going outward. And that's why I keep uh -huh. thinking, well, maybe and there's that big road. There's a big road leading nowhere. <laughs> yeah, there's probably something there. There was probably something there at one time. So who's you know, who would build a big road to a, a nothing on top of a of Acropolis? You know, yeah. that's com and coming directly from the port. So it is it's fascinating. But uh yeah, Darren, you should go to to a Perga. You would love it. It's it's uh okay. it, it's it's fun to go up the hill and it's pretty cheap to stay there. So Oh really? Um, yeah, well, you know you could stay. You see, uh, the nice thing is there's there's lovely pensions there. And yeah, it's 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 a it's more affordable in Turkey than anywhere in Europe or the East Coast for that matter. So wow. So yeah, you could stay. Where I where I stay is is between fifteen to twenty dollars a night. Oh dang, that's pretty good. <laughs> so and you'll be able to find that kind of price, maybe thirty, um, in uh, in that area. So you just find the right pension and the yeah. right deal. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and you go backpacking because there's a lot of, because uh, the area around it's beautiful. I mean, you have these, like I said, beautiful mountains all the way around on all, all, all three sides. And then you have this turquoise water, you know, places where the cliffs just kind of cut right in uh, to the sea. There's under, under, undersea caves. Mm -hmm. And then you got forests. <laughs> Uh, and uh, ancient cities are in the forests. So you're going through these forests, these hilly areas, and you'll discover an ancient city there. And in some cases, they're so well preserved, still have the marble facing on top of them, which means oh. that no looters have got to them. Oh, oh that's good. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Shadi said, Leros Island is near Turkey. Interestingly, they say, Goddess Artemis was a protector of ancient Leros. Turkey can be seen from Leros. All very interesting. Yeah. So there is a very strong connection, as we see, between the Minoans and Anatolian civilization. I know today we associate the Greek Isles with, of course, Greece, you know, politically. But the thing is, is that many of these islands, like isles like Lesbos and Samos, are closer to the Turkish coastline than they are to the Greek coastline. And they're more in the cultural sense, or were up into the exchange of populations in the 1920s, were closer aligned uh, to the culture of Anatolia or that area. So any other questions? I think it'd be fun that, you know, they'll, they'll make these yet. I want to make some money, um, you know, make, make, a, make a, a, a souvenir Artemis of Perge image you know okay. <laughs> i mean there's, I'll put that on the top of my list yeah i mean hey you know yeah. right all right so oh okay so i like my future talks are coming up uh and i see here what am i doing here uh da, 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 uh, what am I, those aren't you i see okay. one me so, okay yeah, doing the Cuskins, right on july 14th is that right yes july okay so, july 14th i'm doing the etruscans all right, so um, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna pack and, uh, and I'm gonna go to sleep. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this talk and I will see you when I talk about the Etruscans, which will be a fun talk.